Okay, get you a hymn book and turn to hymn number 86. Hymn number 86. We'll sing it a couple of times. Stand with me. Isn't it a blessing to know that he is with us? Amen. Don't ever have to worry about him coming. Isn't that right? I mean, when we gather together, he's here because we're here. And uh, thank God that he comes to be with us. I thought about and we welcome you that are out in the parking lot. We're, uh, by faith, we see you out there and we're glad that you're here. And uh, this came to my mind when I was sort of walking around. And uh, that's dangerous sometime when you're walking around and things sort of come to your mind. And the old mountain preacher that I was, uh, that I lived near over in the mountains, you know, uh, that uh, he was so thrilled. He hadn't, he had never preached before a crowd, had a little, little, a uh, bunch of people in his church. And somebody said, we're going to put you on the radio. And he got up on the radio station. And the first thing he said, he said, hello world. Well, out of WTOE in Spruce Pine, he thought he was preaching to the world. And uh, I said, let him alone. Don't tell him any difference. He thinks he's preaching to the world. Well, you can do that nowadays, you know, by means of all of that we've got available to us. When we preach, when we sing, the world is out there. And we can, uh, we can preach and sing and give glory to the Lord. We're glad that you're here. I can't see the world out there, but I can see you tonight. We're blessed that you're with us uh, to be a part of this service tonight. We continue to pray for all that we mentioned this morning. Uh, remember Joe Washburn's uncle, Kevin, Roger and Elizabeth Elliott. Uh, we pray for Linda Forrester that's supposed to have surgery in the morning down in Florida. You pray for her. Uh, Dwight and Aline Atkinson, I talked to him this afternoon. Uh, not much difference in her. And uh, so if the Lord willing, if she doesn't pass away before Tuesday morning, I'm going to take a trip down to Ashburn to be with her and to pray with her. And uh, so you please pray, if you will, uh, for this special need of prayer. Did, do need to make mention. I didn't do it this morning. But uh, if you can't read that, uh, look out on the bulletin board. We need blood. And uh, so if you'll sign up and uh, give blood this coming Thursday, 2.30 to 6.30 uh, in our fellowship hall. And so uh, please, if you're available, if you are a candidate to give blood, uh, sign up out there the time you'd like to come. And uh, they'll do that this coming Thursday afternoon. And uh, you can donate to help other people if you will. I would also just remind you about our little containers that are here to help us uh, promote our mission emphasis and our home missionaries that are working in our country. And of course, you know the need is great across our land, and we've got people that are out there serving the Lord, and we're supporting them and we're praying for them. So you pray for them, and then pick up some of these and uh, give to your children, and you take some of these. And uh, Easter Sunday now, we're going to take them up. And uh, if you don't have coins, then we've got something here for you in the back of the pew. Uh, we've got you covered. And so, uh, so we just want to encourage you to do that. Uh, and if we had our video equipment, we could show you the testimonies of these missionaries that are, that are out there serving the Lord. I've watched them. Uh, I have uh, looked at them. 
and there are a whole host of missionaries in different places where there are not churches that are available. Uh, we've, we've lived where there are churches everywhere, and uh, if you don't like one, you can go to another one. And uh, I'm not sure that's a blessing. <laughs> uh, you know, if you get mad at one, you just find you one down the road. <laughs> don't look at me like I don't know what I'm talking about. I've been a Baptist all my life. Yeah. <laughs> this man got list, uh, missing and they found him on an island and uh, when they got there he was showing them he had been living there about 10 years and they said how did he survive and he showed them a little hut he'd built there's a building over here on this side of the island and there's a building on the other side and they said what is that he, he said well that's a church he is the only one on the island. Well, they said, what is that one over there? He said, well, that's a church. Well, why you got two churches? He said, well, I used to go to that one over there, and I got mad, and I moved over and built me another one. <laughs> and I thought, man, you don't have to live on the island and do that. If you don't like the one you had, you can build you another one. <laughs> but aren't you glad we're here tonight? And we, have, we have missionaries that are serving in places where there are no churches. And they're out there sharing the gospel and preaching the gospel. And uh, they do that when we can help them by our gifts. And so we're planning to do that. And we're sort of going to uh, do that uh, on Easter Sunday. So you pray about that. You be involved. Let your child be involved. Teach them that this is, uh, this is a part of the ministry of this church. is to pray for and to support uh, our mission work across the United States of America. So we pray for that, and we ask you to pray about that. Do we have other prayer concerns you want to mention tonight? I have a niece. Her name is Sharon Rose. She has a lot of issues with her back and other things. Um, okay. Pray for Ray. We pray for Ray. Ask you to pray for Tyler Cochran. This is Candy's son. Uh, he's going to be on talking to them at Duke this week. He's already had one surgery. And uh, he'll be talking to them at Duke this week about uh, uh, some possibilities, some options that he may have. He still has cancer. He's got a little baby, a new baby. Uh, and uh, so pray, pray for this family, if you will, in your prayers. Pray for Walter's sister, Marie. All right, let's do remember that. My uncle was Roberts. I, uh, due to some family situations, I had not been able to talk with him for several years. Uh, he called the other day when he come see him because he's pretty sick. And I started talking to him about the Lord. He said, well, we won't know if we're going to heaven until we get there. I started saying some things to him, and uh, he got saved in his church many years ago. Amen. Amen. We'll pray for that. All right. Let's remember this concern. Yes. All right. Let's remember this request. All right. Let's remember. Let's remember this concern, if you will. Continue to pray for Miss Shirley Epley, and uh, she's still, understandably, she's still in this grieving process and uh, really don't know what to do with herself. She goes in and runs this business every day down in Charlotte and uh, trying, to, trying to keep the business going and trying to just uh, do what she needs to do, and so we pray for her. I assured her. We pray for her when we come to church. Amen. Everybody got a prayer request tonight? We lift that up to the Lord. The Lord sees the hand. He knows the need. And he is able to meet every need that we have. Amen. Amen. Ruby, you want to pray with us?
see every family is the need, and especially for your service, can you move us, can you follow the spirit to in every heart and every soul, for every, for this, this nation, and for every missionary and for Israel, Amen. For every nurse is home. Amen. Thank for every you. family that is in trouble and, mis and people that rabbit try to try us, I pray that you hang upon and everything, Señor. Here for right now and here you were and take it out and apply for the lives. In your precious name, you spend some years. I love you. Amen. Amen. Bless your heart. All right. Let's sing together 367. 367. If you don't know these, this is a good time to learn them while we sing them tonight. 367. We'll sing a couple of verses of each one of these. One and four of these two we're going to sing. Have to get somebody a little younger up here. 323, 323. We'll sing the first and the last. <laughs> Yeah. 
I can just imagine some of our folks sitting outside in their car. <laughs> you already know what I'm going to say. And they're scratching their head and they're saying, didn't we just get through singing that stanza? Did they lose their way in there? <laughs> they sung that first one twice. Well, I want to straighten out all the confusion. We did. Well, we sung part of it the first time. Then we sung it the whole verse the next time. <laughs> and, uh, but aren't we grateful for the day that we went to the cross? Luke chapter 11, if you take your Bibles, please. Luke chapter 11. How do we pray for other people? We're called upon to do that, not just to pray for ourselves, but the privilege we have to pray for others. That is the first emphasis I brought this morning, uh, that we have this incredible privilege to pray for others. If anybody ever comes to you and asks you to pray for them, then you count it a privilege to pray for them. This man needed help. And he went to a friend to ask for help because he had a friend that needed help. And so Jesus was teaching a lesson about how to get help for others. How do you spend time helping others? And a little short story that Jesus told, he gives us some incredible insight into this ministry of how to get help for people who need help. We learned this morning uh, about this privilege we have to pray for others, to seek help for others. It was a bold thing this friend did. You would have looked at it and you would have said, that's not the right time to be bothering anybody. That's not the right circumstance uh, to get a man up out of his bed at midnight, the Bible said, in the middle of the night, and to ask for help. It was not help for yourself, it was help for somebody else. And so we learned this morning, that's a bold thing to do. That is not only a bold, and people that get answers to their prayer, they, they do a lot of bold asking, not just when it's convenient. And you'll find out of this little story that Jesus told, it was stubborn praying. For when he went to this friend at midnight, the friend, night, the friend said to him, do you not know what time it is? Do you not know that it's midnight? Do you not know that I've got my children in bed with me? I read that and I thought, how in the world is he sleeping if he's got all his kids in the bed with him? But he, he went at midnight, not a good time. He couldn't wait till the morning. And he said, I've got my family in the bed with me. You just leave me alone. But brother, his, his asking was stubborn. I wonder tonight, do we do some stubborn praying? We're going to get an answer. We've got to learn how to, how to pray with stubbornness. I didn't mention at the end of the service 
this morning that you cannot read this passage without discovering it was desperate praying. Uh, I found that the people that really learn how to pray for others, uh, it is a desperate thing they do. No wonder the Bible said, Woe to them that are at ease in Zion, that when the needs of others and the urgency in the others are not our desperate situation. I will assure you this need was not met by casual, careless asking. It was desperate praying. Wonder if we're going to have to get desperate in this day before we ever learn to pray. I think long as we think we can make it on our own, we try to make it on our own. But we may get to the place where we are in a time of desperation. And uh, the cry of desperation just sounds throughout this story that Jesus told. There were no excuses that this man that went to his friend to ask him for help. Uh, he did not make excuses uh, he got up and he said, I've got to do something about it. I have a friend that has come to me and I don't have anything to give him. And he got desperate about it. And out of his desperation, he went to another friend and asked for help. And so that is where we are in this story that Jesus told. I'd like to emphasize a second thing tonight out of, this, out of this story that Jesus is telling about the privilege to pray, how and when to pray. We are confronted with our inescapable responsibility. Uh, Vance Havner said one time, the problem is that the situation is desperate, but we're not desperate. I tell you, the situation in our country is desperate tonight. The issue is the church is not desperate. Uh, we're we're going to try to make it. We think we can figure this thing out by ourselves. But this man said, a friend of mine has come to me on his journey, and it's desperate. It is midnight. And he has no bread for his family. And he felt a sense of responsibility. That'd be a great day in the churches across this country if somehow we felt a sense of responsibility. Do you notice what he said uh, when you pick up on what Jesus said? He said, this friend has come to me. He didn't say he came to my neighbor. He didn't say he came to the pastor. But he came to me, this traveler has traveled down the road, and he has come to me. I have a responsibility. And of course, if you study uh, the context of what would take place in, the, in, 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 in that part of the world in that day, if a friend, or it wouldn't even have to be a friend, if somebody was traveling, and uh, they were on a journey, and they came, and it, got, and it got dark, they could go to anybody's house and knock on the door and say, I need a place to stay tonight. And they felt a responsibility to take care of them for the night. They didn't have to know them. They did not have to be a friend. They just had a responsibility that was a part of their culture in that day. Well, could I tell you tonight, we cannot escape our responsibility as the church and as the people of God. If somebody comes to you, you know what God wants you to do? He wants you to be responsible. I, I've had people over the years that have called me up and they've said, Pastor, I have a friend that has come to me and they need help. And I told them I would call you and see what you could do about it. 
Now, I want to be gracious and I want to be kind to them. And I said, well, they didn't come to me. They came to you. Now, if they wanted my help, they'd come to me. But they have come to you. And you have a responsibility. Now, if you don't have the means to help them, and I'm talking about a lot of time for prayer. If you don't have the means to help them, well, you can find somebody that does. But I will tell you, when they come to us, we have a responsibility. I sort of take this neighbor, this man said, well, I don't have anything. I, it's midnight and my children are in bed with me. I don't have any extra food, but I know somebody that does. And I'm going to go to him and get help for your need. Well, I just want to say tonight, that when people sometimes come to us with their problems and their needs, I may not be able to help them, but I want to tell you, I know somebody that does. I serve a God who can help them in their time of need. And here they are. Here this man, here is our inescapable responsibility. Maybe God, maybe God put you in the pathway of somebody journeying through this world. And they're desperate. And you say, I have nothing to set before them. This is what this, this man said. He said, I have nothing to set before them in verse 6. But out of his desperation, he said, but I've got a friend. And if somehow I can get you to him, he will be help you and to meet your need. Well, I want to tell you, there are some needs that people's got I cannot meet. But I've got a friend tonight. <laughs> I've got a Savior tonight. If somehow I can get them to Jesus, I'll tell you, he's never turned one away and he can meet any need anybody's got in their life. And here is this responsibility. You may not can do that, but brother, you can get them to Jesus and Jesus will meet their greatest need. Here is, here's the story. Jesus said you've got that incredible privilege uh, when somebody would come to you. Do you know somebody got enough confidence in you that they'll come to you for prayer? What a privilege somebody will ask you for prayer. And when they come and ask you for prayer, it leads to an, uh, you don't have what they need. You don't know what they need. But you may say like this man, I've got a friend. And it doesn't matter whether it's midnight or not. And he's got children and they may be in the house with him. And I'm sure they're packed around him in that bed. And I know it's going to disturb him, but I'm going to go to my friend and get bread. Hear me tonight. We got a world that's starving and we need somebody who knows how to get bread. And we need to know where to get bread tonight. And it's our responsibility. Here is this incredible responsibility that he had. I, I would point out this emphasis of this little story Jesus told. I'm talking about how do you get, how do you get help to people. And uh, thirdly, We all have inadequate resources. Can you read that verse in verse 6? When this man says, I have nothing to set before him. I don't have what he needs. I have nothing to give unto him. Might be a neighbor that would come to you that's lost. And you may have to say, I have nothing to give to you. You may be dealing with somebody that's battling cancer and they come to you and you say, I have nothing to set before them. They may come and say, I've got a child that is a stranger run and they're not with God. I have nothing. Lord, I need you. Do you know when we run out of resources, it ought to drive us to God who has all the resources that we need tonight. 
I tell you, this man, he didn't use that excuse and said, well, leave me alone. I don't have anything. Just go on to somebody else. Oh, no, his lack of resources said, but I don't have anything. But I know somebody that does have something. And I'm here to tell you tonight, you may not have what somebody's looking for. You may not have what they need. But I'm going to tell you, if you are a believer tonight, you know somebody that does have the answer. And I would just say to you tonight, you hear me well, don't misunderstand me. Before you ever get out there and knock on somebody else's door and try to give them something, you better spend some time knocking on the door of heaven and getting resources from the Father because you ain't going to have a thing to give to them if you don't go to God in prayer before you go to people. Somebody described our churches in this day, they're magnificent buildings and they looked upon them and they said people are coming and they're hungry and they're looking for something and we're nothing but empty bread boxes. They come looking for bread and brother, we don't give them bread. They come looking for something to help them through the day and we don't give them anything. Why, we've got everything else. I'm going to tell you, we've got every kind of things going on and, uh, and I don't need to go down the list of the things that churches think they've got to do in this day in order to attract people and get people to come. But I want to tell you, if they're coming to church and their stomachs are empty and their soul is empty, we can entertain them and we can do everything in this world and they can walk right out that door and their stomachs are still empty and their bellies are aching. And here we are supposed to have the bread of life, giving the bread of life unto them. And I'll tell you, if people get hungry enough, they'll eat out of the garbage can. And you can rest assured, if they leave our churches on the Lord's day, and we have not preached the bread of life to them, and tell them that they eat of this bread, it'll satisfy the longing of their soul. You better believe when they walk away from our churches, the devil's got a lot of garbage cans out there for them to eat out of. And they'll eat trying to satisfy the longing of their soul. Oh, brother, I'll tell you, we need to know to tell people where to get bread. Telling some of the guys before service tonight, when I was in Tennessee preaching and revival and a pretty well-known pastor came one night to hear me preach. And we gathered into the study before the service and he prayed. And I'll never forget what he prayed. He said, Father, if you don't bless this pastor tonight when he preaches, the people are going to go away hungry. And I thought, oh, Lord, you talking about a responsibility when I get up? I'm having, handling the living bread of life. And if I don't preach and present the bread of life, people are going to go out the doors hungry. And brother, the devil's going to have his garbage cans out there full of stuff to sort of satisfy the longing of their soul. I am just here tonight to tell us we've got a responsibility. If If we've ever tasted the bread of life and we meet somebody that don't, they're hungry, they don't have any bread, we know how to get them to where they can find bread. How you doing? (laughs) Well, I want to tell you, according to this story Jesus told, here was this inevitable reward. Here's what the Bible said. This guy just kept on asking, kept on irritating him. 
He just kept on stubbornly, would not take no for an answer. This guy said, leave me alone. It's midnight, I cannot rise. But I say unto you, verse 8, though he will not rise and give him because of his, uh, that he is a friend, it's not because he, but because you will not give up, he will rise and give him as many as he needed. I read that again. He is asking for three loaves. You say, well, did he get three loaves? I don't know how many loaves he got, but I'll tell you, he got enough for him and his family. <laughs> and I'll tell you, when you go to God and ask him, you'll get enough. <laughs> I'll tell you, you'll never go to the Father and leave empty-handed. And then Jesus said, let me tell you what this means. Let me tell you what it means. Verse 9. I say unto you, don't miss the point Jesus said. Ask, and it shall be given to you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth. And he that seeketh findeth, and he to him that knocketh, it shall be opened. And the, and, the, and the tense of the statements there is if you ask, you've got to keep on asking. It's not a one-time thing. You ask one time and don't get it, and you say, well, I didn't think he was going to answer it anyway. That ain't praying. Everyone that asks, he just keeps on asking. And everyone that seeks, he just keeps on seeking. And everyone that knocks, he just keeps right on knocking. That's, the, that's, that, that's the, what he said. Could I tell you the only place you'll ever get living bread is from God, and the only way you'll ever get it is by asking for it. And you have not, James says, because you ask not. But I want to say just a word or two tonight. You say, well, I pray. I pray for others. I have no doubt about that, that we do pray. That's why we're doing these series of studies about prayer, to learn more about prayer and how to get our prayers answered. How God answers prayer. We all believe that tonight. But could I just make a statement tonight? That when we pray for somebody, and we have that privilege and we have that responsibility. We all got people. Surely you got somebody on your heart you're praying for. I'll tell you tonight, the reason I'm in this pulpit is somebody prayed for me. I just didn't by accident one day run into the Lord. Somebody got me on their heart and they started praying for me. Let me tell you what I've learned about this thing of praying for others. This matter of praying for others is not just a petition that you offer to God. You say, well, I prayed, I've asked. I, I want to say a word tonight. It's not just a position or not just a practice that you do. It is the position that you're in when you pray. And I'm not talking about a physical position that you pray from. It is not something, hear me tonight, praying for others is not something we do. It is something that we are. And if we're not are what we are, I'm going to tell you, there's no need of doing what we claim we're doing. You say, Pastor, you got any scripture to back that up? Well, I sure do. I'm glad you thought that. Listen to what 
the Bible said. I'm going to give you a couple of verses. One of them found in the book of Jeremiah chapter 5. Jeremiah chapter 5. And uh, here, here's the connection between who we are and what we are asking. Uh, here's what the Bible said. Jeremiah chapter 5. Boy, don't you wish I had that up on the screen, but we don't have it up there. You have to find it in your Bible. Jeremiah chapter 5. Here's what the Lord said to, his, to Ezekiel, or Jeremiah. Run you to and fro through the streets of Jerusalem. And see now, this is Jeremiah chapter 5. Jeremiah, run to and fro through the streets of the city and look now and see and know and seek in the broad places thereof if you can find a man, if there be any that executed judgment that seeketh the truth and I will pardon it. God said if you're going to intercede for this people, you're not only going to have to ask for it, you've got to be in the right position to ask for it. I'm talking about being in a position to pray for others. You know what the Bible said about Jesus when it prophesied about Jesus on the cross? It said that he maketh intercession for sinners. And I want to tell you, he not only prayed the right prayer, he is in the right position to pray. He loved them, he lived for them, he died for them. And his whole life was for others. And I'm going to tell you, if we assume the right position in our life, then we're in the right place to pray for others. You say, how do you do that? How do you know if you're in the right place to pray? I'll give you three little simple words. I'll be very brief. I want to use the word, first of all, identification. You look again at that prayer that Jesus taught us to pray, and when you read, when you read this prayer, when this friend came to his friend about another friend, you cannot help but see how he identified with this man in need. He got up out of, his, out of the bed. He, 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 he was a friend. He lost his sleep. The whole thing inconvenienced him. He didn't know the traveler, but he identified with him. This man could have said, I'm not hungry. I don't need bread at midnight. But there's somebody else that's hungry. They needed bread. Now, if he did like most Baptists in our day, they'd say, you know, it's midnight. Let him do his own bacon. What, what's he doing out here with no bread anyway? I bet he don't even work. I ain't helping him. Boy, I've heard that over the years in Baptist churches. Well, I provide for me in my four. Man, when you've got that attitude, you don't know how to identify with people that are in need. Just crossed my mind. Laura can identify with this, where I pastored before I came here. Church had blessed, God had blessed the church, had resources, had place in the community. Tremendous opportunity to minister to people, to help people. Little redheaded boy was picked up on our church van and brought to church. Lived in our community. Came every Sunday. Not 
not a good home life. His mama picked him up, moved across town four or five miles from the church. I was out of town preaching revival. Somebody called me and said, you remember this little red-headed boy that came to church? I said, yeah, I do. They said he was accidentally killed last night. His mama's living over yonder in the trailer with her other kids. They don't know anybody. They don't know another church. Would you please come and do his funeral? I said, I'd be honored to do that. I preached that night. I got up and drove hours to come back home. I knew that family. I'd been in their trailer. I said to that grieving mother, do you have any do you have any food? Somebody going to feed you? Somebody going to take care of you? And she said, Preacher, you're the only preacher and your church is the only church I know. So I did what I thought was common sense to do. I went home and I called the lady that was the WMU director in our church. And I said to her, we have a little boy came to our church until his mama moved him and he got killed and they're over yonder in a run-down place and they're over there with, uh, they don't know anybody and I'm going to do his funeral and they have no food. Now you're talking about one time. I didn't want to be a preacher because she said to me, they no longer live in our community and they have moved over in another community and let somebody else in that community feed them. I had to do some repenting after that. I'm just going to tell you. I thought, where in the world do you have the love of God in your heart? Here's somebody that's in need. You're in a position to help them in their time of need. I want to tell you, we got to identify with folks. God wants us to meet the needs of others. You hear their cry. You see their problems. Some cannot look beyond what's going on physically with people and see their spiritual need they have. I'm not surprised that people that don't know the Lord act the way they do. I am surprised why people who say they do know the Lord act the way they do. One of those little boys that came to our church. I got a call that there was a need that lived over in the trailer park. One of my deacons went with me after that, I'd wished he hadn't. He went with me. The only boy out of that family, he had a, had a live-in man living in the house, and the woman was there, and other kids, and this one little boy would get up and come to church. And I found out they didn't have any groceries. I found out they, did. they had a need. They were hungry. So I took, I took this guy with me. You know, he's a leader of the church, and we walked up on the, on the porch of this run-down trailer, and the first thing he did, he looked over there and saw a can, and it had empty beer bottles in it. That wasn't a very productive meeting we had that night <laughs> because he said just as boldly to me, 
Well, if he's got money to buy beer and drink beer, let him buy his family food. And I said, <laughs> graciously now, I said, you're probably right. A man that would go out and waste his money on beer and let his family stay at home and starve to death and have no food on the table, you're probably right. But I want to tell you, I didn't come for this man. I came for this little boy. And I want to tell you, I'm not here to give this man anything. I'm here to help this little boy out and feed him and to help him. You know what you got to do? You got to identify with people. And how, how sad it is in our churches. And we've been eating bread all of our life and somehow we don't identify with people that have no bread. You follow Jesus. When Jesus came to redeem this world, the Bible said he became a man he walked where men walked. God did not come to be unapproachable. He came as a man. He felt like a man. He lived in circumstances. He faced temptations. He knew the limitations. That man, he came. And John said, here's the bread of life that came. And we have handled him. Our hands have handled him. Tell you, John the Baptist identified with them, didn't he? <laughs> oh, listen, you read the story of the life of John the Baptist, you find how he identified with people that were in need. And I want to tell you, Jesus Christ came to meet every need of every man on the face of this earth when he came. To the hungry, what did he say? I am what? Speak up. It's all right if you speak up. To the hungry, I am the bread of life. To the thirsty, he said. <laughs> oh, Lord, do I need to start all over and educate some of you about what Jesus said about himself. I'm the bread of life. I am the living water. I am the water of life, he said. To the dying, he said, I am the resurrection and the life. To the lonely, he said, I am a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. To the outcast, he said, I'm a friend of sinners. I'm just going to tell you, no one of the Bible prophesied about him and said he is numbered with the transgressors. I mean, he associated, he identified with them. And I want to tell you, no church in this county and in this world will ever make a difference in the life of people until we learn how to identify with men where they are. This man was stubborn, didn't want to do it. But the other one said, but I've got a friend. All your objections, but he's still hungry. And he doesn't have any bread. I want to tell you, throw up all our excuses, throw up all of our, what we should do and shouldn't do. I'm going to tell you, men are still hungry. They still need bread. You can get hung up on a lot of things. I don't think we ought to do this. I don't think we ought to do this. I'm going to tell you, the bottom line is that they're still hungry. They need somebody to get the bread of life unto them. We identify with them, with the hungry. I don't know how much of this I need to confess tonight. <laughs> Laura can identify with this. She lived through some of this. church where I was great potential great people love God they just somehow missed it on this how to identify with sinners the church was more of a 
of a showcase for the saints rather than a hospital for sinners. And uh, Can you imagine a big church building with a balcony in it? And when they built it, I, you know, I didn't ask why they did that. But they built that church and they had a whole basement of the sanctuary. And then they had Sunday school classes all the way around that church, all the way around, big classes. But the whole basement downstairs was unfinished. And I asked them, I said, well, what, what, what did you leave it unfinished for? Well, someday down the road, preacher, in case we need that, we're going to, we're going to do something with it. So God bless the church. And we started getting all those kids in from the rough part of the neighborhood, from housing developments. I didn't think it'd make a difference. I thought their children, they'd need loving. And we brought them in. And most time they'd come in and I remember three specifically that who knows what they saw on, on Saturday night. But the mama would drag them out of bed on Sunday morning and send them down to the church. They hadn't been washed. Their hair hadn't been combed. They were just as nasty. And here they came in. You know, and I thought as a pastor, well, Hallelujah. That's sort of what the kingdom of God sort of looks like to the Lord. They didn't see it that way. <laughs> surprise, surprise. This is our well-manicured church. We don't want anybody messing it up. I thought under my breast, bless God, somebody needs to mess it up. <laughs> if God has to send children in here to do it. So we got, we got, we, you know, how we got there that had to be the Lord. I said, we got the funds, we got the means, we can go down there and we can build big assembly rooms, we can build big classrooms, we can, we can, you know, and uh, I said, we got the money and we got talent, we got all these carpenters in the church, people do this for a business. And I said, we got all these kids that come on Sunday and half of them get up, just drag them out of the bed and stick them on our van and send them down here. They come to church, starve to death. They, I said, you know, I, I, there's all right if we're going to, we're going to. When I said to them, and it would be wonderful if we just put a kitchen down there while we were at it. <laughs> Brother, you would have thought the end of the world was coming. Well, bless God, I'll tell you what, they, we eat at home and they need at the house. I said, you're the one, I want you to come down there and fix something for them. <laughs> well, they didn't like that either. Well, you can put that in there. You ain't putting no stuff down there. These are some of the same kids that went out there, probably on the meal they got that day. hungry you've got to identify with that you've got to have a heart for that you've got to care about that you may be well down at your house but brother I know the house they came from I know what they saw on Saturday night I knew what they came from I'm telling you if we're going to reach and minister to people we've got to be able to identify with them Jesus identified with those that were hurting and those that were hungry. Read every, every servant of God in the Bible. When Moses said to the Lord, when the Lord said, I'm going to blot out this people, and Moses got so bothered by it, he said, Lord, these are your people. And if you're going to blot them out, it'd be all right if you just blot my name out too. You talking about identifying with the hurting. 
You think about Paul. You think what made him a great minister? He is able to identify with people. I'm telling you what Paul said. He said some things. Hard to comprehend. Over in the book of Romans chapter 9, when he's talking about his people, Israel, you know what he said about them? They were blind spiritually. Here's what Paul said about them. Chapter 9, verse 1, I say the truth in Christ. I lie not my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. For I wish that myself were a curse from Christ for my brethren and for my kinsmen according to the flesh. I'm not here to tell you everything Paul meant by that statement. But when you read that, what Paul said about his people, the nation of Israel, you could not help but believe that Paul identified with them and Paul cared for them that he said Lord I'll pay any price in order that my people may get to know you and then he said in chapter 10 and verse 1 brethren my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved I'm talking about identification identifying with them Not careful. We just lose touch with the world out there we're trying to reach. I'll just mention it very briefly. That word identification. Here's the second word, sacrifice. A friend of mine has come at midnight. He's bothered me. He won't let me alone. I don't have a need. You help him. But the only way that man's need was met, this guy had to get up and sacrifice to help meet the need. He gave up his physical comfort. He gave up his convenience. Midnight seeking bread. I want to tell you that is sacrifice. You tell me when Jesus hung on the cross and said, Father, forgive them for they know what they do. I'm telling you that is sacrifice. That is sacrifice. There can really be no helping people in their need until we're willing to sacrifice for them. It'll not be convenient. I just mentioned the word authority. You see, when you identify with them and sacrifice for them, you've got the authority to minister to them and meet their need. In fact, we don't have any authority to help people until we identify with them and we're willing to sacrifice for them. Well, that's the word people don't want in our day, in our churches, sacrifice. You identify with the needs of others. You sacrifice to meet their needs, and then you take the authority to get what they need. Did you hear me tonight? We got authority to get what they need. Moses, the Bible said, identified with his people. He chose to suffer with the people of God. He sacrificed for them. And then he went to God in prayer and prayed for them. Isn't that what Jesus did when he came? Don't lose track of the thought I'm pre preaching today on how and when we can help others. And you don't have to look far. I mean, sometime they'll come to you. They'll come looking for you. I don't know what you got, but I sure need it. 
And you say, I don't have what you need, but I've got a friend. I've got a friend who knows what we need. And he not only knows, he can help you. He can help you in your need. Would you bow together with me in prayer? Here in this building, outside in your automobile. My question tonight, are we willing just to assume that position? Not only what we do, but who we are. Who we are. And what we do really doesn't matter until we are who we're supposed to be. That's the issue tonight. Who are we? Are you a person somebody can come to? Are we a church somebody hurting that can come to them and say, oh, I, I think somebody helped me down there. Have you asked? Boy, we ought to get desperate about that. Pray about that. God, here I am. I'm just, I don't have a whole lot, but I'm, I'm your servant. Maybe somebody would come to me in their time of need and ask me to pray for them. Oh, what greater thing you, could you do for somebody? What a privilege to pray for somebody. And then occasionally somebody sends somebody that says, I need help. And in the name of the Lord Jesus, you reach out with compassion and help them and sharing the gospel with them. I just want you to pray, Lord, this, this building would not just be a bread box with no bread in it. But every time somebody comes, and there are going to be people that's going to come in the next couple of weeks, leading into Easter. And I will assure you, hear me tonight, I'm not going to get up on Easter Sunday and put them under the pew because they hadn't been here. I'm just going to tell them about the bread of life and how to find bread. That's my responsibility. And that's our responsibility. Is to have the bread and have the water. And when people find their way in here, even though it might be a couple of times a year when they get here, they need to hear about Jesus and how Jesus can meet the longing of their heart. Would you pray about that? Would you pray about that? You join me in prayer about that. I have, I have talked to some and I've encouraged them to find their way here on Easter Sunday. And when they come in, they'll find a group of people that's just, one time they were lost, but now they're found. And they're thrilled about being a child of God. And they just want to be there Tell them where there is a friend. And his name is Jesus. And Father, I pray you'll put that responsibility on all of us. Help us to carry that responsibility. To share with people that are hungry. And people that are thirsty. If they'll see something in us. We'll not, we'll not turn them away. Because really they're looking for Jesus. And help us to be there to point them to Jesus. Lord, we ask you to help this band of people here tonight in this church, outside in their automobile. That who knows, who knows. That somebody may cross their path. That's got a need. And the hunger in their soul is so evident. Help us to be ready to point them to our friend who met our need. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. In Jesus' wonderful name I pray. Amen and amen.
God's people said what? Amen. Amen. You just be available. You don't have to run them down. They'll run you down. They'll find you. <laughs> when they get to you, if they're looking for you, I promise you, you don't have to try to get them hungry. They're hungry when they get to you. <laughs> Amen. We're trying to make people hungry when they're not hungry. When they get hungry, they'll find, they'll look for bread. We're going to pray for that. You pray for me. We'll pray for one another. Bless you for being here tonight. Don't forget to sign up out there and pick you up some of these resources and uh, help us out. Be greatly appreciated.